Welcome to this presentation on the finite element formulation of beams. Uh, we've looked at axial members before, and so we're moving on to beams, and we'll look at frames next time. Uh, to prep for this uh, presentation lecture, uh, go to the lecture materials. Again, the link is below in the notes, and check out the folders for the notes. Uh, MATLAB, we'll do a derivation here in the middle. You don't necessarily need this M file if you have MATLAB. Uh, maybe interesting to see how that we can do that derivation in MATLAB. Uh, but otherwise, you want to get the MathCAD file because we're going through the, the derivation or the uh, development of the beam solution using the MathCAD. And it should be okay using the MathCAD um, Express version, so you don't need a license. Well, so a quick beam refresher. Beams defines a structural member whose cross-sectional dimensions are relatively small compared to its length, or really long compared to uh, the cross-sectional area. The primary, uh, primarily carry lateral loading that creates the bending. So we're mainly looking at that lateral loading, creating the bending, and shear is typically ignored. So here's the overall sign conventions. We have X is a longer beam, axial length, longer beam. Y is that lateral uh, length distance, and Z is that distance out of the screen toward us, typically because we're looking at it uh, along the side over here. For members that are in axial loading, uh, if it's happy face, so if you kind of see it smiling here, we'll have positive bending and positive curvature. If it's got the kind of a frown, then it's, we call it negative bending and negative curvature. So that's kind of the conventions we'll be using. As a result, our governing stress equations, or flexure formula, while the stress is equal to the negative of the moment times uh, C divided by I, moment of inertia. All right, where C we can also look at as Y. Here is our overall thickness of our material. All right, so negative sign means the positive values of Y and C are in the compression. For positive bending. So it just kind of gets us in the right thing we want up here with negative bending, positive bending, and compression versus tension in those cases. All right, so all of our overall governing load and shape equations as we're looking at the beams, overall we can say the angle, so going back here, all right, if we look at how does y, how does y, things happening in the y direction, change as we go in the x direction. So uh, Differentiating y respect to x, how does y change in the x direction? That gives us an angle. All right, so dy dx is equal to the angle that we'll see in our beam. And moments are the modulus times the moment of inertia times the differentiation of this angle with respect to x. So we can overall define that as the moment. But because of this uh, initial equation we have up top here, if we substitute that in for the angle, we can come up with a second derivative of y with respect to x and also have that as equation for the moment. Uh, if we take the, the uh, differentiation of the moment with respect to x, we end up with the transverse shear force. And again, if we substitute in this equation we have for the moment, we end up with this guy here. And also substituting the um, dy dx, that comes, I guess you can, Right here would have been a whole lot bigger, right? All right, so here's your third derivative of y with respect to x. And one more time, if we look at the overall load that's happening, we take the transverse shear differentiating with respect to x, and we get that overall load taking this equation, we come up with the fourth derivative of y with respect to x modulus times the moment inertia. So again, this is just a reminder of these equations. They're going to come back into play later as we look at uh, um, the equations as we're analyzing and, and deriving the information we need to solve our beam. All right, so keep those in mind here. Also look at beam tables. So for some common loadings, um, relatively basic loadings, we can solve these just using beam tables. You don't have to go through this whole process that we're looking at um, in this presentation. So if you have just a basic distributed load, all right, and I can't leave a beam, you can come up with the uh, uh, deflection equation for that, uh, as well as some other cases here. So here's just one particular table out of a book. And uh, you can see these cases here. All right. So for the FE formulation of beams, the beam element um, is what's shown here. We'll only use local coordinates since beams are horizontal. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But if we look at node I and node J, so we have nodes at either end of our element again, has some overall length here. So we have two um, displacements we're concerned about. We have one is the lateral um, displacement, and we also have the angle or rotation displacement. All right, so only two degrees of freedom. Uh, that we have here. So we got lateral displacement and the units there are length and the rotation or slope at each node. So we'll also have it here at node J. And there's the uh, lateral uh, displacement. The rotation or slope is going to be in radians. 
All right, so we see we got length here and we got radius here. So two different units in that. Again, we'll talk about later um, how that's going to, um, we have to work with that. All right, so for beams, just lateral displacement and rotation or slope. All right, no axial displacement. We're not looking at that in this case. All right, so what we're going to first do is we're going to assume an equation for the deflection, deflected beam shape. So the overall shape is has kind of a curve for it. And so in this case, we're going to look at a third order polynomial function where we have, in this case, four different um, unknown coefficients. And the boundary conditions we could say is uh, we know that we have the uh, lateral deflection at node i is ui1, and that's at x equals 0. The angle, right, the d dy dx at node i um, is equal to our, uh, our rotation at node i. Um, is that equal to zero? And we have the same things happening at node j, so that's where x equals l for the lateral displacement as well as the angle at node j. All right, so that'll help us as we solve our thing using the boundary conditions. All right, so we're going to solve for our four unknown coefficients. We've got four equations with four unknowns. So we're going to substitute in, uh, again, using that third order polynomial, so and um, substituting in for that. Uh, for C1, C2, C3, C4, we can rearrange and solve for, oh yeah, these guys look familiar, SI at node 1, SI at node 2, SJ at node 1, SJ at node 2, and so here are what those um, S values actually are, and hopefully at this point you know what these are if you watched the previous lecture. These are the shape functions, All right, they describe, help describe the shape, the third order polynomial shape of the beam as it deflects. All right. So I'll, I mean, I'll let you go through that particular derivation if you'd like. Um, that's where they come from. So again, those are the shape functions. And y is the lateral position of the beam at any point along it, any point actually in the x direction along the beam. And so with that, we're now going to create the stiffness or displacement relationship using the minimum total potential energy equation, just like we did with axially loaded members. All right, so here we go. So taking the strain energy equation, and so if we integrate that over the volume, we have the stress times the strain divided by 2. And we're substituting that. We've done this derivation before. But ultimately, you end up with this. We've got the second root of y with respect to x squared. And we have that y equation, right? We just solved for it. So here we are in terms of the shape functions and the displacement, lateral displacement and rotation that we have at node i and j. So we're going to plug all that in because we're going to differentiate that twice with respect to x. All right. So there it is in matrix form. So if we solve for that, and we're going to differentiate with respect to the displacement, and the displacements are, again, the lateral displacements at both nodes, so ui1, j1, and also the rotation at nodes, um, i and j. We come up with this. All right, so the minimum total potential energy says the form of our stiffness matrix for a beam is this. All right, so this is the first time we're seeing something like this because we haven't looked at uh, beams before. All right, so the element stiffness matrix for a beam element is modulus times the, the moment of inertia over the length cubed times the matrix of values here. All right, and again, we'll look at more of this in detail as we move on here. Um, by the way, which, which form of the element stiffness matrix is this? Yeah, we kind of hinted at it already. So we said the uh, coordinate system, obviously, we started in local coordinates. Um, and the form is clearly an elemental form. Um, or is it in global coordinates? In elemental form. It's actually both. So it, it's clearly local coordinates because that's where we, we initially defined it. And you can see we got a capital K up here. So that kind of gives it away as being global. Uh, but the reason why it's kind of global kind of snuck in is because all these beams that we're looking at are horizontally loaded or horizontally oriented. oriented. Um, so if we set them up as we should, then they're going to be um, basically end up in global coordinates. And so whatever we see in deflection locally, uh, or globally, sorry, is going to be reflected what's on the local scale. So this is uh, essentially both coordinate systems here. All right, so load matrix. So nodes are not exclusively at nodes. So we can have a distributed load across the whole beam. So um, we need to be careful on how we set this up. So we got two methods. One, we can minimize the work done by the external loads. So using continue with the minimum total potential energy formulation. So we'll do that later. Um, but for now, what we're going to do is we're going to solve uh, the beam reaction forces at the node. So what is the distributive force across the whole beam? What does that look like if it's just applied at the nodes I and J for a given beam element? So that's what we're going to do for now.